This is part five of a study on the tree of life and how it is still available even today. This study was originally done on Blog Talk Radio over the internet, edited, refined, and added to as needed. If we're hiding in anything other than truth, we're not hid. If we're choosing a word that is not fully the truth of God, any of those Bible versions that's missing parts, we're not hid from the wrath of God. Our nakedness is still showing. If any of the truth is gone, we're not covered completely. When they take out those verses that talk about prayer and fasting, one of those verses they'll take out completely from many of the new versions. And the other verse that talks about the prayer and fasting, in order to remove devils, they leave out the fasting part. People that are using those, they're not covered in God. They don't have the full truth. So their nakedness is still showing. That's why God, when he sees that we are faithful, even in the unrighteous mammon, and that's what that is called, the unrighteous mammon. If we're faithful in that, then he'll give us the true riches. Let me pull up the scripture. When he sees that we really do want him, even though we're in one of those versions, he'll lead us into all truth. And this is pretty much what they did. They made themselves friends of the unrighteous mammon. They were hiding among the trees of the Garden of Eden, the unrighteous ones instead of the righteous ones. Luke 16 and verse 8 of Luke 16. It says, And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world, notice it's talking about the children of this world, are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. If somebody is going to be unrighteous, he's saying, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. You're going to dwell among them forever. Everlasting habitations. It says in verse 10, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. So God's watching us even when... We're in the unrighteous mammon. He's still watching us. Because if he sees that we are faithful with that, then he'll take us and lead us into all truth from there. It says, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Because he sees that if we're holding on to that, if we're faithful in that, when we get the true riches, we will be faithful to the truth. It says, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? So God's watching. You know, if we do get into the word, even if it's the wrong word, he's still watching us. And he will lead us into all truth if he sees we're truly seeking him. There's a lot of people trapped into those bad Bible versions. But eventually, if they're faithful in that, he will eventually show them the truth and get them out. I used to use those other Bibles. But it kept gnawing at me when I would see the differences. And I wanted truth. And so I took it to the Lord. I wanted to know which one was true. I didn't want to hide amongst the trees of the garden anymore. I wanted to hide in him. 
and him alone because they couldn't completely cover me. And inside, I knew it. Inside, I knew that there was something wrong. When I would run into, in Acts 8, verse 37, when I would run into that and see that the words weren't even there, I knew something was wrong. That was a hole in what was supposed to cover me. There was parts missing. And so if it's deceptive enough to put the verse number 37, but no words behind it, that's deception. So if there's a little bit of deception in there, there's going to be more deception in there. Because God is a God of truth. He's not going to want to deceive us. And it says here, If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man, see, that other doesn't belong to him. That's man's instead of God's. That's man's word. It's deception instead of truth. And here it says, And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Because then we own the truth when he gives it to us. And right after this, he shows this is two different masters we're talking about. It says, No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. We have to prove what truth actually is and be willing to submit to the truth when God reveals it. If we really love him, we're going to want nothing but truth. We're not going to be wanting to settle. We're not going to want to hide amongst the trees of Eden. We're going to be wanting to hide in the tree of life and make our dwelling place underneath of his shadow, not under the shadow of the others. Ezekiel chapter 29 and verse 3 says, Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon. That lieth in the midst of his rivers. Well, the dragon, the spirit of the dragon is in his waters. That's why it says lieth in the midst of his rivers. That's his waters. That's the flood that he casts out of his mouth. His spirit is with that flood. If it's the wrong word, there's another spirit that's there. So in this picture, if they've taken the word dragon out and replaced it with sea monster or alligator or whatever there's no way to connect that the dragon is pharaoh and from there connect that the dragon and pharaoh was in the garden of eden to begin with this is one of the reasons i'll stick with the king james and i won't go anywhere else it says speak and say thus saith the lord god behold i am against the pharaoh king of egypt the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers which hath said, my river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. Notice he's the one that made it. That's his waters. That's his deception. He made it. He's the one that makes up the lies. And then he depends on us to believe him. You had this same battle in the Garden of Eden. You had the true word, and then you had what the serpent said. And then they had the choice of which word they were going to believe. But see, it's up to us to prove which one is true. We take it to the Lord and we ask him to show us if something is true or not. We're supposed to look at the evidence. Because remember, we're commanded to prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. So we look at the evidence, and this is what I've done through the years is look at the evidence because I saw all these different Bible versions and they'd say different things. And all I could do is take it to the Lord and say, show me what's true. If they don't say the same thing, they can't both be truth if they're saying different things, especially if they're saying opposite things. And so the Lord started showing me evidence on both sides because I had a whole slug of Bibles here. 
And so that's what the Lord started showing me. In this one verse, if they change the word dragon to something else, part of that picture is gone. But as you can see, as we're doing these studies, if you're using the King James Bible, the pieces are there. And as we're looking at the evidence, we need to be comparing from one to the next and see for ourselves. And we can't take what somebody else is saying. Don't take my word for what I'm saying here. Look at the evidence ourselves because it's up to us to prove to ourselves what truth is and what isn't. All I can do is present the evidence and hope to God that they themselves will take it to the Lord and ask him to show them personally whether it's truth or not. When God himself shows us the difference, then we're going to know. He'll wipe away those doubts. But we've got to be willing to look at the evidence to prove whether something is truth or not. If we just accept something as being truth, and we find out later it was another rock that we were hiding in, the wrath of God's going to come down upon us. We're going to be crushed because we've been hiding in the wrong rock. We've run into the wrong mountain. We think we're safe and we're not. But if it is true, if it is the absolute rock solid truth of God, it will prove itself out beyond any shadow of a doubt. We'll know when we have truth. We won't assume or presume that it is truth because so many things look like it is. We got to look at all the evidence, not just some of it. And we've got to be willing to look at that evidence. We've got to be willing to take the time to look at the evidence to see whether it's truth or not. And if you start seeing enough evidence showing that the devil is involved, then it's up to us at that point to turn away from it. Another verse that is absolutely awesome evidence that you can look at both sides of the picture is in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 18. There's so much evidence against the other Bible versions. It's so astronomical when you start looking at these pictures. Proverbs 18 and verse 8 says, The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Okay, when I was looking at this, I'd look at the New King James or the NIV or some of these other Bibles, and they wouldn't say the same thing. They wouldn't even say close to the same thing. They'd actually say the words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles or something similar. Okay, so let's look at the evidence. And another piece of the evidence would be, well, if you go to the Hebrew in the Strong's and you look up the word that has wounds in here that is different in different Bible versions, if you look up the word that the King James has translated as wounds and almost every other Bible version will have tasty trifles or something similar to that, you know, stop and think common sense wise. Would God say the words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles? That's one piece of evidence to think about. Would God say the words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles? What's a tail bearer? It's not somebody that's bringing truth. They're bringing a tail instead. They're bringing deception. So if they're a tail bearer, wouldn't God look at it as something that causes damage? Because that's what a lie does. It causes damage. So you look at that common sense wise. And then you go to the Hebrew and look it up. And see if tasty trifles is even a possible interpretation for the word. Okay, the words of a talebearer is the Hebrew number 
5372. Okay. And the definition says from an unused root, meaning to roll to pieces, a slanderer, talebearer. Okay. Where it says are as wounds, that's one word in the Hebrew, and it's the Hebrew 3859. And it says a primitive root, probably to burn in. What do lies do? What does the devil's words do? It burns in. It says a primitive root probably to burn in, i.e. figurative, to wrangle, wound. There's nothing tasty in here. How did they get tasty trifles as an interpretation for that word when it's not even a possibility from the Hebrew? Okay, so you got another piece of evidence. Would God describe something that comes from a tail bearer as being tasty? I don't think so. Why would they put tasty trifles in there when it's not even a possible interpretation from the Hebrew to begin with? There's nothing there that could even closely resemble tasty trifles. Because it says a primitive root properly to burn in, i.e. figurative, to wrangle wound. There's no tasty trifle even mentioned in there. So, if a Bible is confessing that the words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles, I'd say that's some pretty strong evidence. Put that together with the part about the dragon and the word dragon being gone, and then you put that together with them leaving the verse out that talks about prayer and fasting being a way to remove devils, one verse they'll take out completely, and then the other verse they'll just take out the word fasting. So when you start mounting the evidence, to me, I've looked at enough evidence. I am absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt convinced that the devil is behind those Bible versions. But it's up to every single one of us to prove it. I can say firmly beyond any doubt in my heart that the devil is behind those Bibles. I can give you evidence that would take hours and hours to show that. But see, we've got to be fully persuaded. And it's up to us to take it to God. And ask him to start showing us. This is Romans chapter 14 and verse 5. It says, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Eve was fully persuaded by the seduction of the serpent. She was fully persuaded to believe him instead of God. We can't serve two masters. It's up to us to look at the evidence. Because if we don't, it's our souls that's going to spend eternity with the one that's persuaded us. We're not talking about a few years here. We're talking about all of eternity. We need to be fully persuaded in our own mind. But if we're not willing to look at the evidence, haven't we closed our eyes? The evidence is within the scriptures. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, Prove all things. That's looking at the evidence. It says, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good abstain from all appearance of evil. If it is appearing to be evil, God said, abstain from all appearance of evil. Daniel chapter 3, verse 25 says, He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. And they have no hurt, 
And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Instead of it being like the Son of God, they'll change it to Son of the Gods or something similar. God said, abstain from all appearance of evil. And that's the end of the study on the tree of life.